we're looking at the opening chapters of Genesis because in these chapters, God is speaking into the heart of our cultural situation. God is speaking into the heart of our cultural war. A war, as you know, that is raging. A revolution that is seeking to recast Western civilization and to try and lay a foundation for society without God. We're doing this because people think that that is the only way that we can be free. Because if there is no creator, then we are free to create ourselves, free to define ourselves and find our own meaning to life. Which means we can define for ourselves what it is to be male, what it is to be female. Which is why there's so much confusion in society. I mean, you read it every day in your papers, grown men, husbands, fathers, leading politicians no longer seem to know what being female is. That's because they don't know what being a male is either. So we don't understand ourselves. No one seems to know. Of course, that's just the start. That's just the start of this revolution. Because we're inevitably bound to go much further than this, much further. Because once we've started to redefine ourselves and to recreate ourselves, that is a perpetual journey that we're now committed to, to constantly be reinterpreting, redefining, recasting, reinterpreting language itself. I hope you can see the logic of this. Because if there is no God who speaks, then there is no authoritative word of God. And so without God who speaks, and without God who therefore defines reality, we are left on our own to create our own reality. And so we're left to wield words and to let the words that we wield mean anything that we want them to mean. And so we can create our true selves. Because there was no God who in the beginning said, a God who spoke, let there be light. There is no God who said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness, male and female, let us create them. We haven't got that God. And so all we have is then our own words to make up our own stories, our own myths, our own truths, our own traditions, our own meanings, which is really, really dangerous. Now, you may not believe me. You may think, well, that's just the vicar using hyperbole to get a point across. Well, if you don't believe me, believe George Steiner. You say, who's he? I don't think it was a Christian, but I know that. He was a Jew steeped in Torah. But he was born in a time when language was being recast and new myths were being created. He was born into a Jewish family that fled Nazi Germany. In the course of time, he became a professor of English literature at Cambridge and a professor of comparative literature at Geneva. He spoke and wrote fluently in eight languages. So he was a polymath. And yet, as he surveyed the 
wreckage of Europe after the Second World War, he said that the great tragedy was that the German language, the language of Goethe, the language of Thomas Mann, the language of Hermann Hesse, had become corrupted, debased, because it became disconnected from reality. He said it's almost as if the German language had become mangled to say things and to articulate things it was never meant to say. He said this very clearly in an essay called The Retreat, The Retreat from the Word. Notice that, The Retreat from the Word. He argued that at the heart of Western civilization was the idea that the word, the spoken word, was there at the beginning. Of course, he got that from Genesis. He also got that from John chapter 1, where Steiner actually quotes John, who said, in the beginning was the word. And yet Steiner said, because there's been this retreat from the word, we can no longer take this for granted. Because this anchor has gone. Because there's there's been this great decoupling, a disconnect from the idea that words are meant to convey truth, universal truth, universal, universe, one world. These words apply to the whole universe. And he said these words were disconnected from the real world. And then he said a terrible thing happened. A terrible thing happened because in the heart of Europe, in the heart of Western civilization, in around about 1935 onwards, words had to be used to ought to create and administer hell. In order to kill millions of people on an industrial scale, words had to be used to mask the truth, to create new myths. For if the words to run hell were hellish words, the truth would be revealed and people would see what's actually happening. So words had to be created that hid that. Words like final solution. Words like selection. Words like liquidation. Words like scientific experiments. Words like residential communities. Words like resettlement. Words like disinfection. The worst, showers. Because you tell people who are going to be gassed that they're going to have a shower. That was needed, says Steiner, to veil the truth, to hide the truth, to create a myth, to create a story, to create a world in which mass killing would be tolerate, tolerated, a world in which evil was good and good was evil. Darkness was light and light was darkness. Bitter was sweet and sweet was bitter. You need to recast words. And so here we are. <laughs> in the middle of a cultural war, in the first quarter of the 20th century. What century are we in? (laughs) I always get mixed up. I'm still living in the past, that's my problem. So anyway, wherever, whatever century we're in, we're downstream from George Steiner, okay? We're downstream from George Steiner. In the midst of the cultural war that he foresaw, so did George Orwell, of course. And you say to me, oh my, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what, what's gone wrong with, with our culture? What's happened? How have we reached the stage in our civilization where we can't define things? And I think the answer goes something like this. The answer is, you know, is that people say, I'm, I'm, people say, look, we're, we're living in this world And uh, we're we're unhappy. We're not at ease in this world that we live. We look around the world and we see so much sadness and so much misery. And we know deep in our souls that something's wrong. 
And so, as I say, we feel unhappy, we feel anxious. We hear of wars and rumors of wars. We see nation rising against nation and kingdoms against kingdoms. We hear of famines and earthquakes. We read about Sudan and desperately people racing to catch the last three seats in a plane before chaos descends. And so people think, well, how, how do we explain this? How do we come to terms with this world in which we find ourselves? And so people have come up with answers. Now, they all contradict each other, of course, but at least they're trying to understand the world in which we live. At least they're trying to understand our place in this world, to understand who we really are, to make sense of ourselves. And so they think once we've grasped this, we'll be able to have a basis on which to live. And so great people have come forward. Great thinkers with powerful intellects. And they've said, look, look, the problem is we've got too high a view of ourselves. Too high a view of ourselves. Let's all lower our expectations. Let's not burden ourselves with high ideals that we can't live up to. Let's just admit, you know, that as we look at the world, there are other creatures in this world. There are other creatures, aren't there? We see other, other animals. Well, we're creatures too, like them. We are creatures, and as creatures, we have instincts. Creatures have instincts. So we have instincts, and so we are creatures of instinct. And instincts are, what are they? Well, they're just instincts. They're not right or wrong, are they? They're just instincts. They're just there. That's, that's how I am. That's how I've been made. And so we should just celebrate our natural instincts that, have been, that we find in ourselves. And so we need to stop worrying about our lives and Finding out who we are. We, you know, you're just a creature with instincts and you can't help yourself. You, you've got these instincts. You can't be held responsible. There is no higher purpose, no higher meaning. And I guess it's that philosophy. That drives the pornography industry. It's that philosophy that is sweeping all men, women, and children before it. And we're all becoming enslaved to this way of thinking about our natural instincts. And others say, oh, others say no, no, that's, that's too much. That can't be right. There must be something more than this. We can't just be creatures of instinct. And people have said, other people have come forward and said, you're right. We, there must be something more than that. Why are we here on earth? Well, we need to work. We need to provide for ourselves. So the whole purpose of life is to produce, to create an economy so that we can all buy and sell, eat and drink and prosper. And so we have to so organize society that men and women simply become units of production. Interchangeable units of production. We need to erase these male-female distinctions and if we have children, we'll just put them into some sort of care, some sort of warehouse, where they'll be looked after other, by other workers, if we are to have children at all. Because we need parents to go out to work. Why? Because we need taxes. We need to create wealth. So we can't afford people not to go out to work. We need as many people to work as we can. And if there comes a day, therefore, where you are no longer a useful unit of production, let me give you the address of the Dignitas Clinic in Geneva. Because you're worthless to society. But what we need are the rich and poor, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the owner and the worker. All these people need to work. That's the point, main point of life. And other people said, oh, it can't be, oh, those, those are very bleak outlooks on life. 
It must, there must be something more to humanity, and of course there is, because other people come forward and say, well, we're, you've got to understand, we're not only just units of production, we're not just creatures of instinct, we're psychological men and women. We're, we've got psyches. And we've got to understand our psyche. Well, how do you understand your psyche? I've got to do all this training that's meant to uncover my unconscious bias. No, it's unconscious, so I'm not sure how I can find it. But anyway, I've got to dig down, and no doubt one day I'll discover that I'm a, I'm a racist. So I've discovered this unconscious bias, it's going to be made conscious. But because I'm a psychological person, I've got very clever arguments as to, re- to why that can't possibly be true. So that unconscious bias has now become conscious, I'm going to bury it again. Because I don't like the truth about myself. And so here we are, living in this world, confused, anxious, caught between competing claims, wondering how to live and wondering what the purpose of our lives are, and suddenly you turn to Genesis chapter 1, you go, thank God. At last, what a relief. For at last we have a word, a word from God that explains our world. Now remember what I said last week. Last week I said that Moses has written Genesis in order to provide the Old Testament people of God with hope. And the reason why he was doing that, you'll remember, because the Old Testament people of God had been enslaved in Egypt, and they'd been enslaved to pagan ways of thinking. Well, you would be after living in Egypt for 400 years. And so what Moses is trying to do is he's trying to free the people of God so that they can learn to think God's thoughts after him, so that they can begin to taste freedom, so that they begin to understand who they are, and they don't, that, they don't, that they don't have to be bound by the false gods of Egypt, just as you and I don't have to be bound by the false cultural myths of our own day. Genesis chapter 1 is setting us free. And so Moses is trying to help God's people to understand that just as a golden eagle is free, have you seen a golden eagle? Flying on the thermals in Scotland, that the golden eagle is most free when it is most constrained by the laws of nature and by the currents of wind that can lift the bird up on its pinions and send it soaring into the sky. So the golden eagle finds its freedom when it's living in harmony with the laws of the universe. And so what happens is we, when we become to understand that to serve God is perfect freedom, that's not, that's, not, that's not slavery, that's not binding you, that's setting you free. Let me just say this, if we as a church, if we come to God, each and every one of us, and say, Lord, teach us, you have the words of eternal life. For you made this world and you made us free us. For it is the truth that's going to set us free. Help us to understand you. And in understanding you, so understand ourselves and the world in which you have placed us. And so in Genesis 1, Moses writes down what God had revealed to him and says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God and in the likeness of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You think, okay, sounds good. What does this mean? To be made in the image of God? Well, you know, this concept is so rich, you could spend a long time unpacking it. I'll try and keep it short. But at the very root, the idea that we are made in the image of God means that each and every one of us, each and every one of us, is a a person of immense worth. 
immense worth. Can you see that? Every human being, no matter how young or how small or how old or how frail, that person has the image of God that has been stamped on them. This gives them a rock solid, gives you a rock solid, irreducible, objective glory, significance, and worth about you. That's just stamped into your being. And that can't be taken away. It can't be dissolved. But neither, notice this, can it be earned. Just as an aside, it's interesting to see some of the arguments against the coronation. People saying about Prince Charles, well, what's he done to earn it? He hasn't been elected. What's he done? He's a weak human being. He's a man full of contradictions. He's caught up in all sorts of sins and passions. That's the point, isn't it? Because he's done nothing to earn it. Nothing. That office has been given to him by God. He hasn't earned it, but neither have you earned the right to be made in the image of God. That's just something that's been given to you. Of course, in ancient Egypt, only the Pharaoh was made in the image of God, no one else. Only the Pharaoh. But here in Genesis, the image is not just given to an elite. It's something that's been given to all mankind. Men, women, children, the unborn. It's given to the unborn. It's been given by God to the person, to the whole person. Now, I don't want to get into all these debates as to where it's located. Some people say it's in the mind. Some people say it's in the soul. Some people say it's in the body. No, mankind is a, what, it's a psychosomatic unity. That's where we are. we are. We're psychological beings, spiritual beings, and physical beings. And the image of God is stamped on the whole of our being. Which means, listen to this. No matter what you've done, no matter how low you've sunk, no matter what terrible mistakes you've made, no matter what awful sins you've committed, you are still of immense value to God. Because He made you. He made you. Now, you might say to me, well, Nigel, I'm not sure why, why is that so impressive. I could go to a secular psychiatrist and they'd, psychologist, therapist, and they'd say exactly the same to me. No, they would not. What they would say to you is, no matter who you are or what you've done or how low you've sunk, you're a person of great value. And that's where they would leave it. They would leave those words firmly planted in midair. Because they couldn't give a reason why you're a person of immense value and dignity and purpose. They haven't got a reason for that. The Bible comes along and says, we've got a reason. God comes along and says, I've given you a reason. You're made in my image. That's why you're a person of immense dignity. So Christians come and they're told by God, and God tells the world, you're of immense value. It gets, gets even more profound than that. Let me just say this. God was thinking of you, you, you as an individual. God was thinking of you before he even made the world. He was thinking of you before time. He was thinking of you in eternity. He thought of you and of your life. And he thought of you when he knitted you together in your mother's womb. He wove you in the depths of the earth. He made you in the secret place. His eyes saw your unformed body. He ordained all the days of your life before one of them ever came to be. Can you imagine that? That's an incredible thought. Because he had you in mind before the world was made. From before the beginning. The Bible begins in the beginning, but before the beginning... God was thinking of you. And then there came a time, there came a moment, there came a day when God brought you forth into this world that he had made. 
David said this in Psalm 91 as he was looking back. He said, you, Lord, you're the one who brought me out of the womb. You are the one who threw me onto my mother's lap. You are the one who was my God from the moment of conception. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, I'm not an unthinking creature of instinct. I'm not just an anonymous unit of production. I'm not just a psychological being, being dominated by my unseen biases. I'm a mystery even to myself, but I'm not a mystery to God who made me. God breathed into my life and made me a living soul. And so I have worth because, let me just say this, God does not create junk. Now, this is true no matter what people may say to you. You may have suffered great abuse at the hands of all sorts of people, and they may have told you things about yourself that are terrible. But let me put it bluntly like this. Who cares what serfs and peasants think when the king of kings and lord of lords sees in you a person of immense worth that he created from before the beginning of the world? That's the first thing to say. <laughs> I'll be quick, okay? I'll be quick. Not only were people of immense dignity, were people created to live in relationship. This goes really deep, very deep. This goes all the way down. And you can see how Moses brings this out in the text. Because when he comes to describe the creation of men and women, God says, let us make man in our image. Let us. What is this us all of a sudden? Where's that come from? God hasn't said it up till now. He's just said before, he just said, earth bring forth creatures and the, cre the earth brings forth creatures. He says, skies bring forth birds and the skies bring forth birds. He says, seas bring forth fish and fish are there. He just speaks and it's all there. But when it comes to create men and women, he says, let us. Who, who is this us? Well, as we go into the Bible, we discover that God is one God, but three persons. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's a trinity. He's living in relationship. God is living in relationship. And so, as we're the image of God, we're also created to live in relationship. And this need to live in relationship goes all the way down. We have this, this, this deep need, don't we? And we know it because when we want to punish people, we do this. What's one of the worst things you can do to punish a person? I'll tell you what, put them in solitary confinement. Now, I've read somewhere it takes three weeks. Not sure if that's true or not, but I, I seem to remember that, reading that some years ago. Put a person in solitary confinement and for three weeks, their whole personality will disintegrate because they won't know who they are anymore. They'll lose their sense of self. And we know that too because we, we do this in our own ways if we want to shun people. What do we do? Well, they walk into a room, you walk out, right? Does that happen to you? Somebody wants to shun you, you walk in, they walk out. Someone wants to shun you, you phone them up, they put the phone down. You unfriend them. You say to them, get out of my life. You ignore their calls. You delete them. You cancel them. And do you know what that causes? Deep pain. Deep trauma. Horrible confusion. Because we're made to live in community. We're made to live in relationship. Above all, we're made to relationship with God, who made us. I'm going to finish now. Give me three minutes. There may be some of you thinking, oh my word, this just rings so true. I know this is true. I just hear those words and I can't argue against it because it, it's true. I know it's true. I haven't been able to articulate this before and I'm hearing things that are, are just now make sense to me. But you may be thinking, some of you may be thinking, I'm, I'm just a bit nervous about committing to this. I've been coming to church and I'm just nervous about committing to God. I mean, what's that going to do to my life? 
I need, I need evidence. Vicar, I need evidence. Can you give me some evidence that God actually loves me? And God actually wants a relationship with me. Can you give me some evidence? Not just theories, some evidence, some historical evidence. Let me just say this. I've talked about the pain of losing a relationship. There was once a day in my life where I felt as if I'd lost one of the deepest relationships in my life. You might know that before coming to Nutsford and going to Latimer House, I was a very happy vicar in deepest, darkest Devon at four rural parishes in the middle of nowhere. Nobody ever went there, just me and the cows and the church wardens and the sheep. Anyway, <laughs> there we were, and, you know, we had four children, and three of the children were now in school. Yeah. And we just said Imogen. So Caroline said, shall we go to Exeter? So I said, yes, let's go. And so off we went with just one child. Felt like freedom. I wanted to go to a bookshop. Caroline wanted to go to Liberties. So Caroline said, well, would, you, would you take Imogen? Sure. Of course. Leave her with me. You will take really good care of her, won't you? It's my daughter. Of course. You're not out of your sight. Relax. So off we went. I go to Waterstones. Karen goes to Liberties or whatever shop it was. And we arrange to meet in 45 minutes time. We meet up and she says to me, where's Imogen? I said, you've got Imogen. No, 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 no. You've got Imogen. I've got Imogen. I left with you, Nigel. And suddenly I realized that Imogen was lost. That feeling of loss for about 20 minutes is completely devastating. I'd lost my daughter. She was gone from me. And I'll tell you one thing, at that moment, there was nothing I would not have done to get her back. I would have shouted at every single person, have you seen my daughter? She's in a blue pram. I left her in Waterstone. There was no indignity to which I was not prepared to descend. I'd have gone into every hovel, every drug den. I'd have gone anywhere to get her back. I was prepared to look at every nook and cranny. I was prepared to abandon all the dignity that I had. That's what love does, doesn't it? Well, you want evidence. There was a time when Jesus Christ, when God sent his son into this world to look after his children who were lost. That's you. That's me. And do you know what Jesus did? He came calling. He came lifting up his voice to the whole of mankind. And he came calling for men and women to come to him, men and women who are made in his image, men and women who are made for relationship with him. And so I'm saying to you, if you want evidence, look at Jesus. Look at him going down into the grave. Why would he go down into the grave? My friends, I don't want to make too fine a point on this, but that's where you're going. You're going down into the grave, but Jesus Christ has been there before you. And he's come out of the grave victorious because he's come to save his people, his children made in his image. Now here is the evidence of what God has done to win you back. He went down every alley, every path. He went to every pit to search for you and bring you a person of immense worth, a person made for relationship. He's done that to bring you home to the Father's house. Let's bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope that it gives us. We pray, Father, that we might come running back to you. We thank you that you did not leave us that came searching for us. We thank you that we're made in, the Im in your image, made for a relationship with you. 
Forgive us all our sins, we pray, and overcome our doubts and fears. In Jesus' name, amen.